Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by John Sparrow of the Violent Femmes. John, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Bert. I really appreciate it. Sure. This is really cool, man. Today we are talking about the love of Slingerland. You, uh, you're a collector, you're a restorer, you're just a Slingerland super fan. So Absolutely. Why don't we talk about first, what got you into Slingerland? Uh, well, my father's a drummer. And uh, actually, my, my dad played with this uh, polka, you know, Frankie Yankovic is. He's a polka king. So my dad's he's a drummer. And at some point, he was, uh, he had re, you know, semi-retired from playing out. And he decided he was going to pull out the drums, clean them up. Uh, it's actually a great story because, I, well, his kid is a 54 Slingerland Radio King. And uh, I, I'll never forget, he was cleaning up the kit. And he, he took the heads off. Well, they were, cat, he, they were the original calfskin heads, and he was washing them in a sink. And I, hmm. I, I said, oh, I didn't know any better. I said, yeah. is that how you do that? You know, like you can just like wash them with soap and water? <laughs> yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, you know, he had, his, he had the Slingerland kit, and then I started learning it through him. And I was, I was exposed to Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and – it was Slingerland drums. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that was the sound. You know, I didn't know any different. I mean, of course, I saw different uh, clips with, with Buddy playing Ludwig. Sure. But it was, it was the Slingerland thing. And actually, that what really kind of solidified that whole love of Slingerland was that we had a drum shop here in Milwaukee. And I'm sure I don't, it, you may have even heard of this, this uh, uh, fella. It was uh, Faust Music. And Bill Faust, the proprietor, was a huge, huge Slingerland uh, fan himself. I mean, he, of course, he sold all different, uh, you know, lines of drums, but he pushed Slingerland heavy. And mm. so when it came time to like, oh, I'm going to have my own kit now. I mean, I learned on my dad's kit, of course, but now yeah. it was time to get my own. He pushed Slingerland and really, uh, you know, Gene Krupa, you know, that's the, that's the big, it's the sound. It's, that's, that's, you know, and I love that music. Yeah. So that really kind of got me into as far as buying and thinking about what I'm going to play Slingerland drums. And then, of course, I hung around a drum shop, like uh, so many of us, I'm sure. Sure, of course. You know, of, of, of a certain age group, we had, yeah. we had that uh, opportunity. It's, it's, of course, nowadays that's changed. Yeah. But uh, to hang out with him and then hear these stories, you know, I, you know, he had Gene Krupa on his floor. It did, you know, he had did, done clinics and he was, you know, he was friends with the Slingerland family. You know, this is Bill Faust here in Milwaukee. So, you know, and it became this, it was almost like a, you know, mystical in some sort of way. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. that's Bill, yeah, between my father and, and, you know, of course, watching videos, Gene Krupa and Bill Faust, it really became this this fascination with, with the drum line uh, as a side, you know, aside from the restoration, all those different things. It was just a love of the brand. Uh, it was prestigious, you know. I mean, uh, like any other company, you know, with uh, Ringo Starr and Ludwig, you know, yeah. he's think about how many kits he sold. Oh, Gene God. Krupa sold a lot of slinger. So that's kind of how I got the buzz on the brand, just, you know, the drums themselves, you know, aside sure. from all the other stuff. So, yeah, that's that's kind of my story. It is prestigious. I feel like there's something about Slingerland and maybe it's partially because it's it's not around anymore. Well, it's, you know, it's right. possibly coming back, which we can talk about more later. But um, sure. it's that sort of like, you know, it's just iconic. And I feel like it's a very, it, it, it could be because of Gene, but it's a very classy brand, very classy drums, like the Radio King and the, it's just, it yeah. feels nice. It really is. You know, it's funny you say it because when you, I literally got goosebumps when you said it because I think about the Radio King and I think about Gene Krupa and his sound and, I was such a fan. I mean, my favorite album is the Carnegie Hall concert. And you can and, and think about, you know, how archaic that recording quality was in those days. Yeah, sure. And you can still hear that the way the Radio King, it rings and it's got it's got this home. It's, 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 mm -hmm. It has a tone. It's got a sound of its own. Yeah. I usually try to do this where I can direct people like as you're listening to this, if you want more of a deep history dive, I think within the first 10 episodes i'm pretty sure i did one with mark cooper that's about more based in the history of the family so people can check that one out too for that and then there's jim moritz did uh an episode called growing up slingerland which was one of the first three because his dad worked for slingerland and it's full of tons of good information so those are other 
Slingerland episodes um, people can check out to get, you know, some other history background. But what we're going to be talking about today is more um, some highlights with the drums and the gear and some stories through the decades um, that you've learned in your experience as a restorer and just, again, a fan and picking up that kind of stuff. You know, it's funny because, uh, <clears throat> of, of course, I had those early those early stories about what got me into the, the whole Slingerland brand. But um, it was really, what, what's really cool about it, and I mean, I know this holds true with all the other brands, but eventually, you know, through selling on eBay and, uh, you know, uh, being on a drum forum or whatever, wherever, uh, you know, where I was, you know, checking and researching, yeah. there's such a fraternity of sure. all these fantastic people that I've gotten to meet just because that's because of our love, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's really, it's really something special. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I'm sure that's with other instruments, but there's absolutely. just something, there's something so cool. I mean, we're drummers. We're, we're the best, right? So well, something. absolutely. <laughs> you know, and there is a fraternity with drummers as well. So, oh. which I actually really appreciate. I mean, yeah. there's very little ego involved and we love to share information just like what you're doing here with the podcast. And yeah, you know, so it's, it's fantastic. It's just yeah, to yeah. learn. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. All right. Why don't we go back um, and, you know, take it back as far as you want and we can just kind of pick pick a start date and then we'll just go through the decades and then we'll end when the brand basically stopped and was shelved and then returned. But um, go ahead and uh, and kick it off here. You know, so like we were speaking about before we started the podcast, just kind of catching up and you know, seeing, you know, what we were going to do with all this. And um, that is my experience, really, uh, as far as restoring and, and playing sl the Slingerland brand. For me, it started, uh, you know, and really my, any kind of not like true knowledge I have, it, it started in the, in the 30s, as far as the brand. Obviously, I'm not at all. I'm saying yep, uh, sure. I had a what, what we would call a garage find. In this case, it was an attic find, okay? Yeah. So it was a... Uh, um, that had to be, I think it was a mid mid to late 30s Radio King set. And a friend of mine who's not much, he's, he's, he's you know, he was a hobbyist. He said, hey, listen, I, got, I have these drums. You might be interested and you want to look at them. And I'm like, okay. And I was in my 20s, so <laughs> I didn't have much money. And I said, well, I don't know if I can buy them, man, but, you know, we'll figure something. I'll, look them. I'll look, at least look at them. And it was this Radio King set, and it was white marine pro, just beautiful. And, and, and actually... I don't remember the the tom mount really offhand, but mm -hmm. uh, the point is, is that that was my introduction to really a true introduction to like uh, restoring. Mm. So I did the same thing. I was I took the calfskin heads off the original calfskin heads and uh, washed them, and but then I started learning about the hoops. You know, oh, the, why are they why are they dull light? Well, those are nickel nickel mm. plated as opposed to chrome plated. Yeah, and uh, so that's when I started kind of really learning about the, the, the intricacies, you know, of, 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 of the drums. And then of course, you know, when we got into the wartime, which I've never personally come across any of the wooden yeah, lugs, the roll it, rolling, you know, bombers, the rolling yeah. bombers. Oh, beautiful. I've seen them of course at all the drum shows, but yeah, yeah my, my fascination and experience started in the thirties. Of course they had a, a, a deeper, longer history before that. Sure. I mean, like these, I was thinking of a story when I, we were talking about the calfskin heads about, uh, you know, Slingerland and Ludwig, they would rush down to the uh, to the stockyards, right? Is that and they would try to get hi the hides? Yeah, and they would fight over, you know, who was <laughs> getting the, so the better quality hides. Yeah, uh, I, I love those stories, you know. And, I do too. And and just the um, I don't know the pride, you know, that obviously they all put pride in their instrument. But yeah, I mean, it was my experience started in the '30s. My dad's kit was again it was nineteen. I think that was fifty four. And nice. uh, yeah, yeah, and then trying to find parts because he didn't like the he didn't like the L arm mounts that they were using those days, so he threw them in the garbage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I and I I believe that they were using those. They started, you know, and I, again, I'm not totally an expert, but I believe they started using those in the 40s. These hmm. these the, the brackets, the L, you know, that actually mount on the bass drum. Sure. You yeah. know, and learning about, you know, what the drummers went through and my dad in the 50s. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was like right around the 30s. The stuff from the 20s, I don't really have much knowledge on. 
And um, but I mean, of course, as a Krupa fan, I've I've seen yeah, the pictures. Seen and, it. And, yeah. Well, yeah. Let me let me ask you real quick. So, um, I'm always maybe it's just I feel like it's partially branding. It's the name Radio King. I just love it. I've never actually played one. I I almost bought a set and then I sent it to Brooks Tegler, who's just kind of a a legend in the Slingerland world. And I think he was like, you might want to watch out for it. Um, but Radio King. So as far as I understand, Radio King was kind of just a name that was put on a bunch of different things. What what was the the time period of Radio King? Because as far as I know, it kind well, of ends in the 50s, right? Right. Well, see now, and that's, you know, and I can't say for sure. I know, But right, they were... they. they the snare drum, and it's it's actually kind of ironic because I have the, um, you know, I bought it on eBay. It's like the uh, blueprint of the Radio King snare drum, the oh, patent cool. yeah. that they had to send in. Cool. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they were granted that. In it was like it's if I'm not, uh, I have it here. I want to say it was it was on my birthday. It was July 18th or or 17th. Oh wow! Uh, in in the late 30s. Huh. But I don't know for sure, you know, and they, if, yeah, then they started they started putting that name on a lot of kits. But I, yeah. I think it uh, essentially it started off with the, the snare drum. I mean, I yeah, I know they were you know they were they were putting you know my dad's kit. I can say it's a Radio King, but is it a it doesn't say Radio King, but in the catalog sure. it is. But yeah, as far as the snare drum, you're right. Uh, and I actually I highly recommend that you pick up. You've never played a Radio King, you say, huh? I have not. No. Well, can oh. you explain a little bit about what? Well, first off, happy birthday, early birthday. Oh yeah, well, it's, it's coming up. Yeah, it's July sixteenth today. So yeah, it is. <laughs> I've, been, I've been avoiding <laughs> thinking about it. And yeah. As you get older, it, it's not as important. But the yeah. Radio King, you know, it's funny you bring that up, and it's such an iconic sound, you know, through through history and. And it's it's funny because a lot of the people that I know, and we all talk about this in the community, and of course it's written down, uh, you can get a good one and you can get a bad one. They mm-hmm. were not consistent. They, okay. And they, a lot of them were out of round. You okay. know, they would go out of round over over, over time. Gotcha. And, um, and it was hard to put heads on them because they'd go out of round. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, I hate, I'm not trying to, you know, disrespect Slingerland, but they weren't all, they, there were some duds. There were duds, you know, and I mean, I yeah. know that firsthand. But, um, yeah, that sound is iconic. Again, I, I, I go back and I reference that Gene Krupa, uh, you know, his his snare sound on the uh, Carnegie Hall concert, you know. Mm, yeah. But there is something about it, just like anything, you know. Um, it has a sound of its own, just like, we, you know, the Superphonic or the Dynasonic uh, or even Acrolytes. You know, everybody, they all have a, a, a character. But yeah, there's something about that, and maybe it's because I have this. I'm biased because I love you know the, the mystique of Slingerland, but there is something about the Radio King that's just fantastic. Yeah, you know? and it's been mentioned in a few other episodes, but it's just cool too that um, obviously Radio King. It was the era of radio being king, and you know yeah, you had your Gretsch true enough, broadcaster, yeah. and it was just that that radio. Right. Um, you know, big bands you know, being broadcast. And, and again, you yeah. know, uh, it's 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 the Radio King went through a lot of, uh, you know, being going out of round. Or if you hit certain eras, like in the, and I, I know I don't want to jump around too much, but you know, in the fifties they were using the clamshell strainer, hmm. and that thing was known to cause so many problems. It, you know, it slipped and it would break. Uh, but in general, I think that 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 design and 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 an idea is there's something really special about it. Now the yeah. drums uh, that's, I'm talking about the snare drum, of course, sure. you know, the kits, um, that's, that's a whole other thing. You know, I mean, a lot of people were, were doing similar things, but it's that snare drum. I, I really, when I think of radio King, I, I think about the snare drum first and foremost, like you were saying, they were taking names on anything. If, if it, you can sell some more drums and call it a radio King. Fantastic. Yeah. You know? Yeah, really? So, now, if you yeah. if you talk about Slingerland in the '30s, are there any other drum sets that aren't a Radio King? Does that make sense? Like, is, yeah, no, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as I know, in my experience, they they were called they were they they were different they were different uh, models. Okay. Student models and uh, jobber models and things like that. 
And as far as I know, and again, you know, I, you know, I'm a fan, but I'm not an expert necessarily. Sure. But um, a lot of those were all the same shells. I mean, it, it was the mahogany with the reinforcement. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But it was that that snare, which was was the one ply steam bent maple. You know, um, so th- you know, it's like my dad's kit didn't have a floor tom. It was, uh, I forgot what it was called. It was like ensemble kit or, uh, you know, I, I forgot exactly. Yeah. Luckily and I got a know, kit like that where I, I bought one at a, I got one for 50 bucks and it was like, and I looked it up and I was like, oh, this is actually a kit where it didn't have a floor. And it was like the New Yorker or something like yeah, that. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. and then it's like, oh, well, this one came with, this one came with wood blocks, but that one didn't. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. But I think essentially it was, you know. And again, I, I could be completely wrong, but all my experience, it was they were all the same shells. I mean, up, you know, through the '30s and the '40s, and I think in, sure. you know, in the, when we start getting, you know, and even into the '50s and the '60s, they started using, you know, they were changing how many plies they were using. They're going to using, um, you know, three ply maple with three and four, you know, and and so on and such forth. Yeah, and it's also while we're in the earlier years, it's it's interesting too to note that Slingerland was a major banjo manufacturer. Um, yes, which is yeah. pretty cool to see the matching banjo and matching drum set. And I don't know when that actually stopped, or if it did. They probably kept making. I want to say in the late twenties. You know, oh, okay, I think. Okay. I, yeah, but you know, again, going back uh, to talking about uh, the the calfskin heads. Well, it wasn't, you know, he they were going down there, racing down there, trying to get heads also for the banjos. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, really? Yeah, I, I want to say it was like the late 20s when they stopped with the banjos. You kind of forget. Um, and they had and guitars, I, too. They were doing guitars. Oh, you know? So that's a, that is a great point. Probably something for another discussion, but I had, I've heard, and I know it's debated with like the Les Paul, like log or whatever, but I, I as what I've heard is that Slingerland was the inventor of the first electric guitar. And I know that's... I've heard that as well. Debated. And I don't want to I don't want to ruffle any feathers, <laughs> but I've, I've heard that as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, we throw it out there. People can research and find out. But um, it's it predated the the log or whatever it's called. You know, yeah, yeah. Of, the Les Paul where he had... <clears throat> yeah. It was, yeah, it was, right. Yeah, he's um, actually from Wisconsin as well. Wow. Les Paul, um, yeah. Okay, so... The family, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming just in the 30s, from what I know, business is just booming. Drummers are going, you know, people are buying drums, thanks to Gene Krupa. I don't think that can be stressed enough, the importance of his. He's probably the, the like, Gene is kind of like Ringo, but earlier to get people loving drums. So that had to be their Oh, their, absolutely. Their I mean, goose. We, yeah, we know the significance of Gene Krupa in, in a drumming world, in a music world. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. yeah, of course. Yeah, and he, they, yeah, yeah, they sold a lot of drums. Gene sold a lot of drums. It's funny because I was just reading, uh, uh, I know that the company at some point sent him a check for $2,000. I believe it was $2,000 thanking him for, you know, being such a, a big proponent of uh, mm. catalyst to help sell all these drums. And he sent the check back. He said, I don't really, I don't deserve this. I don't think that uh, I really was, you know, what a humble guy, but yeah, yes. I mean, he can say what he and feel the way he wants, but let's be honest. He did. He yeah. was the Ringo for Slingerland for sure. I mean, he yeah, was on yeah. every cover up until 67, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Think about that. You know, I mean, you had so many other dr- great drummers, Ray McKinley. You know, I, but yeah, he was the guy. And you know, yeah. the irony is that you know the 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 Carnegie Hall concert. And I don't want to get off topic here, sure. but if you put it in perspective, that that recording didn't come out until I want to believe I believe it was in the fifties. They discovered that and it came out. Wow. So all this all this hype and I mean all, all this stuff about Gene Krupa, it was word of mouth. Of course, there were recordings. Yeah, yeah. Or sure. if you, you had the money and you could afford to go see a show, it's all based on live performance and recordings. Wow. You know, but that whole big boom, what we know of Gene Krupa and, um, you know, that didn't serve until the 50s. So it, that says a lot how, you know, that guy, what kind of an impact he had on the, on the Slingerland brand, you mm. know? God, yeah. Unbelievable. I, cer- I certainly believe that that 
that Carnegie Hall recording was really what I know it really revitalized a lot of their careers. Yeah, sure. But it it really I guess it solidified it. But yeah, I mean, you know, there was no there was no Ed Sullivan. <laughs> no, no. You know? And again, there's no TV. It's all the the radio. It's, it's yeah. Think about that. I mean, you know, that's really something that says a lot to have that kind of an impact and that, you know, for, you know, and help the company sell drums like this. Yeah. You just think of families sitting around looking at the radio, you know, hearing ads for Ovaltine. Maybe you you read a a, a downbeat magazine. Sure. Of course. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in the thirties, any other stuff going on before we move into the forties, obviously radio Kings, Gene, all that stuff. Any other thirties notes? You know, I mean, not that I can think of, I, and it's okay. funny because I'm actually kind of excited to get to the '40s and 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 talk about you know uh, the idea of now we're in wartime, yep, and now we have to change. The, the, we're changing lugs because we're, we can't. We're, we're you know rationing, yeah. And wow, you know, think about you know. Of course, things are you know without getting too deep, we're not going to get into it. But you know, we're in turbulent times now. Now they're going. They're, it, now you think about in the '40s and it's wartime. And how it affected the manufacturing of these instruments, where they started ch- having to change what they used, you know, yeah. for for materials. I mean, that sure. blows my mind. I, it's it's really crazy. Yeah, that's people who listen to the show know that that's like one of my favorite parts of this is just what the brands were doing during that time and what they were because um, a lot of the brands were just like, you're now going to make. And I always forget, I need to like write it all down, but I know Rogers was making like gauges for airplanes. There's just different things that each yeah, right. company was pulled into to doing. Um, like I was saying before, uh, before we were recording, like Premier was doing um, sites for anti-aircraft, you know, uh, guns. And it's just crazy. So, um, and I know. Diversifying, you know, I guess, I guess we, well, obviously we still see that nowadays. Oh, yeah. Um, like a company like 3M is going to make a mask and then they're going to make a uh, tape, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's, that's the nature of, of business, I suppose. And they, they have held up pretty well. And there's guys out there like uh, Joe Meckler, Joey Boom, who does, who's been on the show, who does a lot of great uh, wartime drum restorations and cleans up that wood. And I just got seen like, the wooden pedals and I saw his collection at, at the Chicago show, like wooden snare stands, wooden floor Tom legs. It's just, it, it's really, yeah, right. And it, it's again, like you were saying the sign of the times and how it affects, and in this case drums and yeah. what, what, you know, and you see that, I mean, we see that now too, as you know, as, as the history of no matter what company it is, you know, as the economy waxes and wanes, you see, uh, you know the screws that are used, and if they're using softer, softer metal because it's cheaper. You know, I mean these, all these little things. Or let's, like for example, let's we can even talk about the canister thrown. Yeah. You know, uh, I know in my case, and I'm, I'm maybe I'm spoiled now, but I don't. I mean, it 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 makes sense for a jobbing drummer in those days to be able to throw all that stuff right into a canister thrown and go. You know, mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. spoiled because I we. We just throw it into a case and then somebody, you know, they move it out. But as a yeah. jobber, and I, and I mean, I'm not saying that I, I wasn't, I didn't just hop into this world, you know, of, of quote unquote success. But I mean, yeah. I was a jobber oh, and to have sure. those, those, those coffin, those big coffin trap cases, that was, that was a pain. Oh, so yeah. there was a lot of brilliant things because there was, you know, so many more jobbers. Uh, I think, you know, unfortunately right now with everything going on, there's, there, there's no jobbers. Yeah. But, um, you know, it it really because it, it went from a drummer being in, for example, like in in the early 1900s, doing a theater show. So well, there was you know you would you didn't have a bunch of you had hardware, but it was separated, and all the gear was in a theater. It stayed there. You know, yeah, maybe yeah. You, you weren't moving around as much, or if you did go to do another gig in a theater, the gear was already there. You know, what I mean, there was already sure. equipment there. So that's another thing where. Once you started seeing the drummer, in this case, because the trap kit came together and now we were moving around jobbing, um, th- that was that was one of those things where it's like, wouldn't it be great if the seat was the case? Yeah. You know, it's brilliant. I love that, you know? It and is I'm a brilliant. Big, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of canister thrones, of course. You know, they're, you know, I've, again, I've, I've, cool. I've you know? never, 
I've never used a canister thrown. I've sat on, I've played it. Um, I've, there's there's a drum shop here in Cincinnati called Badges, and I've I've sat on one there because he has a, a new one. I think DW still makes them. Um, oh yeah, 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 and they are just, which is actually brilliant. Yeah. Well, well, I was gonna say. So back in the day, I know I've seen pictures of like Buddy using them, and he's just completely bent over. Like, so you're not adjusting the height. I guess you're raising your snare stand. You're moving your other stuff to adjust to your thrown your your right right yeah correct well and buddy i mean that's yeah that's his style but yeah yeah and he had i was just talking about this with another colleague is that you know i put so much time in it not to get off topic but i put so much time into my posture because i read all these books about buddy rich having back or elvin jones having back problems yeah yeah and you look at that and he was always hunched over you know yeah but uh, yeah i mean I st- nonetheless, yeah, they would. You could raise everything up, but I, yeah, I was. I love that. I, you know, again, going back to Slingerland, that was the thing. I would see Gene on a canister thrown, and uh, again, uh, it's it was a sign of the times. You know, now we and have it, jobbers and they're moving around. You know, yeah, and it matches 30s and the forties. Yeah, or a yeah. box. Yeah, I've seen those too. Those pictures, they're they're like boxes. They're yeah, but they're the seat. Yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah, it's really yeah. interesting. So forties, and I, I wanted to 40s. look it up. Um, it's so the the L thirty seven is the the kind of like edict from the government where they said that's the name of it, where it said to companies like you need to stop using. I think it was they could use ten percent metal right. or something like that. So that's what created these right. unbelievable wooden drums. Yeah, and, they uh, had a they had a ration, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, isn't so. that something? You know, and then as far as the forties, um. I'll tell you the two things that stick out of my mind the most as far as when it came to Slingerland. And again, I'm, I love Slingerland, but they had a lot of bugs they had to work out. And I think one of them, again, I mentioned it earlier, it was that L arm mount. Yeah, it, it was. It you know they didn't. I, and I always say this word wrong. If the, the you know like the knurling or curly, I forgot mm-hmm. how you say that. On the L arms, they didn't have that. So you'd have nickel, smooth nickel L arms. And those those uh, those brackets, they it just didn't work. Yeah. And so my, the reason my dad threw them away because they they stuck around until the fifties uh, was because they would slide. You would see these if you ever seen any of these videos of Gene or Buddy playing, and the ride cymbal slides while they're yep. playing and it falls, collapses. Yeah. yeah. You know, it just wasn't working out. You know. Um, so. I, and again, I hate to be, I don't want to be negative because no, I love but the company, it's, it's true. but they it's had the a truth. lot of bugs. Yeah. They had a lot of bugs to work out. The other one that was always an issue were the, um, the Tom mounts, mm-hmm. the Ray McKinley. Uh, it was like a, a I, I don't know if I believe that's what they call it. It was a squ- it was more of a, a rectangular square mount. That mm-hmm. was nice. Um, but it was those, the other ones, the consulate, those would slide. They would always be slipping. Um, and of course, so they worked out, you know, they had to work out a lot of bugs. It's, it seemed like yeah. when you start getting into the late forties, into the fifties, they started kind of working a lot of those bugs out. Well, that's but so then, common. I mean, what did yeah. your dad put on in place of those? So he just would use this uh, regular symbol stand. Got it. Yeah. And oh man. And, you know, and I'll tell you, I was, when I, when I started restoring his kit, I was so mad at him. I said, what, what, what did you do with the L arms and the brackets? Oh, I threw them away. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I'm trying to call these, you know, I'm this 16 year old kid and, and, and I'm trying to call And We didn't have the internet, you know, yeah, and I'm trying to course. call these drum shops and I'm trying to explain to these guys and they're like, yeah, no. What? And it literally, they'd say, why do you want that? It never worked. And I said, well, because I'm trying to restore my dad's kit. Yeah. But um, yeah, so he would just use a you know, regular symbol stand. That's funny. Um, okay. But, you cool. know, again, like I hate, to, uh, you know, you don't want to be negative, but I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of these companies, they had to work out a lot of bugs. And Slingerland was one of them. But I can tell you, um, all those drums, aside from the snare, always, they had a woody, there was a sound there, you know, there was yeah. really a sound. Now, is it the heads? Is it the tuning? Uh, could you get that same sound out of a Gretsch? Well, I don't know. I mean, because I was a slingerland, I was a slingerland nut. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm trying to figure out. Wow, is this is uh, are these lugs from this kit that I found? Uh, is this chrome or is it nickel? Because it's really bright. And why did they use nickel on this kit? And you know, and then trying to figure it all out. And it seems like you know, even that far back, there was an inconsistency as far as 
how they put kits together. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah, for sure. You know, like, uh, you know, we can get into the whole, um, the badge and the serial number thing, which, you know, that, that's an issue that goes across the board as far as all these drum companies. Yeah. Why, you know, and, and then this is the thing that we all sit and run and talk about at these drum shows. Well, wait a minute. This isn't, this isn't really all original. Well, yes, it is. Well, no, it's not because these are the screws they use to attach the lugs. And I said, well, you know, you'll, you'll have this conversation. I'll say, listen, I swear this is, it came from my uncle or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And then it becomes this, then you see, they start rubbing their chin. Really? Yeah. Why would they use these kind of wash? That's not what they did. Well, well you know, maybe it's Friday. Exactly. You know, I, I don't care if it's the twenties, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they, I, 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 and, and that's the fascination too. And with drum and, you know, the collecting and all that in yeah. general, but I love that. I love yeah. seeing, you know, like why would they have chrome plated hoops and all the lugs are nickel. Pl- you know, I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it was so left I, over from the last run. Or there's a absolutely. bucket, there's a bucket you know? of screws and they grabbed the wrong one. Absolutely. You know? And, you know, and, uh, you know, and it's, this isn't just a slinger line thing, but, you know, we all, we, all of us, we talk about, well, the, you know, the, uh, the quality of uh, cars that were made in, in those days, you know, quote unquote. Or yep. in this case, the drums. Well, you know, I love slinger line, but, you know, it, it has to be noted and, and be fair that, you know, some of those Radio Kings, they went on around. They didn't stay in around. They didn't all sound, you know, and th- that's that holds true for any company. But um, I have to say, again, aside from the mystique, Slingerland, I do. They had something they had. They really had a sound, you know, spanning yeah. all the decades. Sure. So, yeah, the 40s. Uh, there were some issues, but those drums, they stay consistent. I think that, and, and of course, then into the 50s, my dad's kit is the same, same, um, it's the same design, you know, the mahogany maple reinforcements, yeah. you know, and then things changed in the 60s, of course, you know, and I think, you know, that's, you You started, and I, and I don't want to jump ahead on you, sure. but, you know, the in the 50s, it seemed like there was a lot of, again, a lot of inconsistencies, but is not with the sound, you know, it was the hardware mm-hmm. and, and yeah. things like that. They were trying to iron out a lot of bugs, you know, but yeah. uh, that, that sound was there. I'm not yeah. saying all the drums, you know, some drums were duds. It happens, but there is always a, cons- you know what I mean? It was always a, a something about those drums mm. to this day, of course, obviously. The, the sound is consistent and, and uh, it, it keeps going on too, where throughout these decades, there was uh, a consistent, feud with Ludwig as well that should be in the back of people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was like a rivalry there. Like, like I said, yeah. you know, reading these stories with them fighting over the, the hides that they were picking yep. out at the stockyards yep. and who yeah. got there earlier. And, uh, going through uh, the garbage and then seeing what the other people were doing. That's kind of a, a, a known You know, thing that's, that's a whole other topic too. I mean, yeah, the whole... <laughs> The yeah. stuff that I had friends or not, you know, I have friends that are older than me that used to go and tell me stories about digging through their trash cans when they were in Chicago and finding oh. things. Really, Man. really wild stories, you know? Yeah. That's like yeah. another, that's a whole other episode. The battle that's all, of Ludwig. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but yeah, so again, you know, the sound was, there was a certain thing there. And then of course, we when we got into the 60s, when they started, you know, now you start talking about you're battling with, you're battling with amplifiers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I, I've, of course, I've heard different stories about other companies painting the inside of the shells because they were just trying to pump them out. But I've heard that it too about like Ludwig, yeah. Slingerland, Slingerland, you don't see a lot of that with Slingerland. Um, yeah, they, they hmm. really stuck. I, I really believe that they they held true to that idea of quality, you know? Yeah, and man, I just... And they honed in on that, you know, I'm sorry, I have to pound, pound sure. it out again. It's like they really started to hone in on the hardware in the uh-huh. 60s. But I, I guess, I guess too, you know, you start thinking the demands of rock bands. These guys are playing harder. So it affects the way they were making, you know, how, you know, the design of the shells. They needed more projection yep. and stability. And the hardware had to hold up, you know, yeah. which, is, which is ironic because in my mind... Uh, you know, I've been, I've played in heavy metal bands and I can still play, uh, you know, an old 40s cymbal stand and I won't knock it over. But I think it was the demands of the time, you know. Yeah. But they the they really started stepping up in that regard, in my opinion, you know. Yeah. And I want to also mention and bring up the, um, 
So I talked with Bernie Stone, who bought all the equipment about oh um, yeah yeah he's the ra- the radio yeah. frequency machines to make their shells, which is pretty fascinating. That's the um, first for me. I've you know, and I I, I guess it, yeah you know uh, I call myself uh, you know a, a huge fan, but that one I've never heard. I've never yeah. heard that story. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot to mention that before about the you know no, no. themed episodes, but that's so. I, well, and as, I appreciate that because you know I I, I guarantee you we're you know I'll, somebody's one of us are going to get a text or uh, a tweet and say well you know I actually you were wrong about it, well, absolutely please <laughs> and tell me yeah. what was this whole thing about the frequency you yeah. know you know and I mean uh, I love I love it I love yeah. hearing those things yeah and, of course and people can go check it was like you know twenty fifteen twenty episodes earlier but basically and then we can move on but it it. I know that this the system was extremely technical with a lot of math and the in the numbers, but what it did is it basically they put it in, put the glue in it, put the you know the the actual wood, the plywood, if you will, and then yeah, yeah. the radio frequencies quickly and uh, efficiently dries the glue very fast. Boom, it's dry. They can just keep making shells. So that was the system. Interesting. Well, he's he knows. I mean, again, what we were talking about earlier. So many. There's the stories and the knowledge. Yeah. There's so many things that keep coming up. Yeah. You know, and I've again, we can we'll get to that. You know, when we talk about some of the more modern stuff, because I have a lot more, a lot more knowledge uh, about some of these crazy little stories when it comes to the nineties and in the two thousands. But I love that. I love that. We, we can all share it again, going back to having it be like a fraternity, you know? Yeah, really? So we're in the sixties here. And I mean, I gotta, I gotta think that, you know, the Slingerland family, when they see, uh, on, you know, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, they're thinking, Oh man. (laughs) Oh, I, I'm, yeah, I, that, I guarantee that gave them a run for their money. Yeah. You know? And I mean, those people over at Ludwig were working around the clock. And, you know, now if you think about it, too, Gene, now Gene's, he's kind of getting to the point where he's slowing down. Mm-hmm. And Buddy was, <laughs> Buddy is Buddy, <laughs> as we yeah, all know. And he's down. coming and going, uh, you know. And, I, you know, really having a, a, a brand ambassador, I think it, it was, things were changing. And I think it really was tough for them, you know. And through the 60s and into the 70s, it, it just started uh, it was, I don't know. I, you know, it was hard for them to kind of stay on top of, you know, we have, when you have Ringo Starr, you know, that's, he's a tough one to go against. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but they, it seemed like, you know, and I mean, I, we, we, you know, we can get into all the intricate parts of, you know, like I say, how they were doing the shells, three ply or five ply, sure. those sounds. But as far as the brand, it seemed like it was kind of it. It kind of put a little. It took a little wind out of their sail, you know. In my opinion, and yeah. they had their hardware getting sorted out, uh, and then you know, of course, taking, uh, you know, taking ideas from different company. Oh well, let's do something like this or like that. But um, it seemed like they kind of went. You know, and this is my opinion, but it seemed like they went through kind of an identity crisis there. Mm-hmm. When it, once once Ringo, the whole late sixties. And in the 70s, it was like, you know, they didn't really get into the whole uh, uh, fiberglass drum. They, you know, they did that, but they didn't really push that. Uh, it was kind of like they're always, it's, and I, and I, again, I don't want to disrespect Slinger, like, so I love them, but they, they seem like they're kind of a day late and a dollar short on a lot of things as yeah. far as concept as the 60s into the 70s, you know, and in the 80s, they started messing around with, uh, you know, uh, like, basically cardboard shells and trying to cut costs. Cause of course we know going back to that whole idea of how in the seventies and the eighties, um, you know, we were going through a, another financial crisis and how that affected what materials they were using and, yeah, and so definitely. on and such forth. And, you know, everything was changing. So, and, and it's funny because again, as a huge fan, I, when I started learning about this, I, I felt bad. I was like, God, oh, that, that kind of, that sucks. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. look at these shells. They're warping. Well, that's because they're made out of card, essentially like glorified cardboard or carbon yeah. fiber, you know. And I mean, they, they stuck, they, they held true with, you know, they stuck with the log designs. People weren't using LR mounts anymore. So now you start getting into different designs as far as symbol stands, you know, and all the hardware. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but the design and that look, again, going back to that classy, like the tier, you know, like the, the, there's something about those lugs, the Radio King lugs, you know, and then, yeah, of course, absolutely. the new design. I, You know, there's something about it just beautiful. They just yeah. look classy, you know. Like art deco kind of. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. You know, and then I think every company kind of went through some periods of time where they were always dealing with the, the snares trainers. You know, it's like mm-hmm. that's the one yeah. thing that we're always grabbing at <laughs> and adjusting. And it's never because, you know, of course, we're drummers. Nothing's ever right. No. You know, and that's the one thing because, this, you know, like Buddy Rich was he was known for being he was crazy about his snare drum. Always, you know, it was never right. But, yeah, you know, snares trainers, they seem to kind of get that right. You know, um, after the fifties, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was it, it, again. It's it was it's too bad for Slingerland in those years in the sixties and seventies, and of course into the eighties, where they lost. I think they again. My opinion is they lost their identity, and it was hard to kind of keep up with the times. You had yeah, other the, now, you know, yeah. you had more companies coming in here. You know, of course, we could talk about Vox or Trixen, mm-hmm. but I mean, th- there was the, the Japanese Pearls. brands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and Tama and all that. So it was tough, I think, for them. And um, yeah, and I don't want to jump ahead on you, but uh, the nice, the one exciting part of more of the more modern period of Slingerland was the '90s. It's we saw, you know, because uh, Gretsch had purchased uh, the you know Slingerland, and uh, Buzz King, who you know, he really, they really gave it a strong effort. And they really, I, you know, it, it, it seemed like there was more of a, um, a possibility there for the brand, mm. you know. And I, yeah. again, I don't want to rush, you know, and I don't want to just go over the whole uh, 60s and 70s no. and 80s era. But it was a tough time for them. I really believe that. Can I ask you and, one question you know, about the 70s? Um, yeah. Obviously, it, it, you know, it went through regular drums, you know, regular sizes. Everything was great. Do you oh, ever yeah. come across in your um, collecting the Slingerland Phantom, the like the acrylic um, kits? Have you ever seen? Well, that's why I, 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 that's what I was saying earlier. I know they. I've never come across one. I've never mm. seen one. Yeah. But uh, as we know, they did they did mess around with that. But no, I've never seen any of those. Yeah, got to be super rare. I mean, you just they did. You, listen, I'll tell you, they did some really wild stuff that people didn't know about. Yeah. But there's documentation of which. You know, I have, again, I have friends that have come across some of this stuff and really wild designs. So they were trying, but no, I, yeah, n- none of the, I've never actually never seen any of that myself. Yeah, I'm just looking on, on a, um, um, it, uh, looking on a forum here and it just says, I don't know if this is true because it's the first thing I'm seeing, but it says they were, they were there from 72 to 73 um, and there you go. There's your answer. You yeah, know, I mean, you have on. to be, a, you know, and I, I, again, I like to consider myself, uh, a, yeah, the acrylic phantom kit. I think that's yeah. what it was called. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a fan, but no, I never, and I had no, I had I never had any motivation. Hmm. There's you know, an ad. There's an ad that, that says, out. uh, Slingerland makes one thing perfectly clear. Their new acrylic phantom. New, outfit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. And, he, and of course, you know, and then like a lot of companies, they were, you know, they were, you know, to try to appeal to, who, you know, to the market, you know, these kits that were wrapped in uh, corduroy or yeah. denim and, you know, or um, just all these different designs, you know, they were mm. always open and willing to do that. But, um, yeah, I think with, with a lot of these import kits, you know, that started like in the 60s when you started seeing that in the 70s and 80s, yeah, it just... You flooded the market. I mean, we see it now. There's how many drum companies are out there now? Yeah. But um, and I guess people, you know, and they're shopping for price because now you're going, coming into the 70s and the 80s, and we're going through a recession. And yeah. I mean, we're lucky if we could get gas, you know. Of course, sure. And, and so if we're going to buy a drum set, you mean a whole drum set? You know, how are we going to be able to, you know, make make it affordable? And mm. so you, you, unfortunately, you cut you cut corners. And I think that yeah. you know they did that too. That's and kind they, of a parallel brand, to now. You know, with people who are hurting for money right now, and absolutely, I can't even imagine. I I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. and again it comes back to the sign of the times, and seeing how they adapted or didn't, you know, throughout time. And so, like I was saying, coming into the nineties, if if you don't mind me, kind of please do. I'm I'm interested ahead. in the nineties because I don't really yeah, know because, much about you know, it. Yeah, and 
you started seeing you started seeing a lot. Well, I mean, in, regardless, people are trying to cut costs. You're trying to make money, and they they had a problem with like lug fasteners. You know, um, they would strip. For example, I had a I had a kit and I was playing and I heard this rattling in my floor. Time, I'm like, what's going on? And I, oh man, a screw came out. You know, out, out of the lug. So I went to try to you know after the gig put it back in. It was stripped. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, that's strange. Well, and, well, that was that was pretty common in mm-hmm. the '90s. You know, and um, later on, I actually had the, the the opportunity to talk to Buzz King. And I asked him, I said, why is it that, you know, all these things were, you know, they, I, I had that problem where everything was stripping. He said, well, it was softer metal. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it was, it, it was cheaper. It yeah, was cheaper really. to, to, you know, to do that. And um, I did have a Slingerland light kit for a short time. And obviously the quality was, you know, those were maple shells. They weren't the maple, mahogany, maple. Uh, you know, stuff that was assembled, like stuff was being like a manufactured, you know, machine in Taiwan and sent mm-hmm. back and then sent back for, it was strange, you know, yeah, because yeah. of cost. So, but I can tell you that there was something about those shells. Uh, they really got it right. The, um, you know, the artist, the artist custom. And they, and I still have my kit and it's, it's there's a certain sound there. I, you know, I can't, I can't describe again, coming back to, you know, of course, any drum manufacturer that, you know, someone can say, well, I have this Ludwig kit. It's, it's got the sound. Well, fair enough, but we're talking mm-hmm. about Slingerland and they, they really kind of Buzz King really captured that the light series drums were fantastic. That was their, that was the top of the line. And then all the, you know, the artist custom, it was, you know, artist custom and classic. If it was wrapped with white Marine, Pearl, all these different things, but they had a sound, you know, yeah, and yeah, then they went to the, uh, you know, that the the, the the pearl type of Tom mounting system and all that. But essentially, they stuck to that same formula, same lugs, same floor Tom brackets. And then, of course, you know, there was always changing going on as far as uh, cymbal stands and thrones and all that and pedals. You know, that was yeah. always a, that's always a constant I notice, you know. But, just trying um, to figure it out. It, it's yeah. interesting to me because yeah, yeah. I think as a as a, a person who's looking at it from the outside, you'd think like, oh, 90s Slingerland, you know, no, I don't want that. And it's actually kind of a parallel that I heard about like Speed King pedals where where uh, yeah. Vincent, who's been on the show, said like, no, the 90s Speed Kings were awesome. Like they were great. They're more reliable. They're They're more this and that. So it being from the 90s doesn't make it bad. I mean... Just newer. right, no, right, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, yeah. Well, and it's just it happens to be, I think, who was who was running the show, you know, yeah. and 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 the decisions they were making. And um, again, I, I praise Buzz King because he and I, again, I've had the opportunity to talk to him a number of times, and I just told him, I said, you know, there was something about those drums, and he would just kind of, you know, laugh like he knew. <laughs> they really put they, they I really believe that, that you know he he was running a show and he put the time in to make those things right yeah he really and he did a lot of special things with Slingerland at that time unfortunately the carpet got pulled from under him you know with uh Fred Gretsch selling you know and that that really screwed a lot of things up can you explain you know, that him. like like what actually that that last bit there with Gibson and, and this and Fred Gretsch being involved, like what actually happened at the end? Well, as far as I know, the story is, is in a, again, uh, there's people that could probably tell me that I, I don't have it all right. But as far as I know, the story is, is that, yeah, Fred Gretsch sold it. And I think that um, as far as I'm aware, Buzz and everybody else, they didn't even realize what was happening. And it was just kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, it's done. You know, and they sold it to Gibson, and you know, and uh, we saw a lot of this on, you know, and of course this is maybe, well, I mean, we saw a lot of it on eBay. You know, a lot of okay. a lot of his, all his stock just it, it went out to different places. You know, people bought it, and then they just it, it literally moved on to Gibson, and unfortunately, and then we saw you know Music Yo and different things like that. There was all this you know excess excess stock, but. The carpet just got kind of pulled from underneath all those people at that time at Slingerland. And that, that's that's a bummer. And then what happened, and we saw, 
Slayerland goes to Gibson. And Gibson, they had Pat Foley doing the finishing. And uh, Sam Baco. And the quality was impeccable. I mean, amazing. I mean, they really, they, it's like, it's like, I'm not even going to, you can't equate it to, the, you know, the, the old Slingerlands. I mean, because they, they always had the Radio King, you know, the, yeah, that was always an option. But the drums themselves, I mean, the maple shells, they, the finishes and all that, of course, it's amazing. But I, Sam Baco, I think, was the guy that was, he was really more in charge of, um, you know, the shells, okay? Yeah. And uh, they really captured it. Unfortunately, it was overpriced. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, I think the, sure. and I, I mean, I can't say I know this for sure, but I mean, basically the attitude from what I gather is let's price it very high so it's going to attract people. You know, it's like, well, it must be worth it if it's X amount of dollars. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. in this case, the drums were really amazing. But they were too expensive. Yeah, you can't you know? price yourself and out. They price no themselves nice out. They that's that's my opinion. Yeah, sure. And I think that a lot of us share that same opinion, you know. And then as things started kind of going, and I think that money wasn't coming in like it should be, uh, I think Pat, from what I from what I know, I think he moved on to different divisions, or and then Sam went on to do different things, and um, a lot of. A lot, so you have parts and you have shells, and then they sent it to the Baldwin factory where they were making pianos. And I think that's where you started. To, that's where you started seeing a lot of like the wraps were they were coming undone, you know. And I and I yeah. and I, I can't say for sure, but I think a lot of that was okay. You're going to refinish pianos for today, and then on Thursday we need you to wrap drums, you know? And it's like, oh, okay, how yeah. does this work? You know what I mean? And if you're handy, you can figure it out. Yeah. But I think you started seeing like the quality control tanked and uh, a lot of wraps were, you know, undone. Uh, you started seeing a lot of snare drums, uh, like, you know, bearing edges were strange. And, uh, and then again, which is, I think, kind of the norm when it comes to the drum companies, inconsistencies as far as, well, wait a minute, this is a Studio King. Why does it have a twerking logo? You know what I mean? A a sticker on the inside. So it was like, all right. But the drums always really did sound great. The shells were great. And, um, yeah, and then, of course, essentially, in my opinion, Gibson tanked them. They they tanked themselves. So then, um, you know, all that stuff was in storage. And that was the that was where I started really kind of you know having a network of collectors and and you know enthusiasts and we're always talking about well yeah we heard it there's a warehouse and all this stuff sitting there <laughs> and you know and so and so is just sitting on it and there's a divorce and a family you know all these different things and it's like well that's that's you know whatever the case is when are they going to come back <laughs> and where are all these parts and you know and. You know, because we love the brand. Again, it comes back to that that enthusiasm. And which then now, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, which kind of brings us up, and you know, I guess essentially up until uh, up into uh, I want to say the last few years. Yeah. That uh, a, a, now a good friend of mine, John Ollis, he purchased all of that stock from them, and and he's a drummer, and he's you know he loves he loves sling, he loves the brand. And he sat on. He's been. He's got all this. He's got all this stuff that he's sitting on. And you know, he made me a few. Dr- he would gift them to me. You know, hey, you know, I know you're a big fan. So here and there, but um, it was, you know, he he had all this stock, and he was. That's I think he was crazy. hoping that maybe whoever the new people that would buy the the name, you know, they would they would take this equipment. And um, I don't really know where any of that stands right now. That's I, I stay out of people's personal business and all that. But of course, we now know that DW has bought the brand, and I think that's fantastic. You know, I do too. I, I th- you know, the quality that the, the, I can't say enough about DW. I mean, I I, I endorse a fantastic company called A and F Drums mm-hmm. out of uh, Texas, and of course, I love Slingerland. Um, but I respect DW, and I really I think as a fan of the brand. I think they're going to do some great things, but it's really, it's 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 crazy to see Slingerland have such a tumultuous uh, history, you know. Yeah. And it, how it's affected 
not only what's going on in the world, of course, in the local economy or stuff, to see how all these things have, but they've they've somehow kind of kept going as opposed, you know, in, in their own way. Whereas Rogers, I know Yamaha bought them some years ago. Uh, you know, they just, it just fizzled, it kind of essentially fizzled out, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm hopeful to see that DW is going to, I'm hopeful that DW is going to, you know, they're going to turn out some quality, quality drums. I'm yeah. sure. I wonder. But yeah, when. what a history, you know. I, yeah, what well, a history. I wonder yeah. when, because yeah, because they own last it. Last I heard, yeah, last I heard, it was they were just going to do snare drums, Radio King snare ah, drums. Okay. okay. And then I, essentially, that's kind of what Yamaha did. Is that uh, when they bought uh, Rogers? I think that was, it was yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially Yamaha, I believe, that bought them. They just did the Dynasonics. They yeah. introduced the snare drums, you know, which I've I've played a few of them. Sound fantastic. And I was kind of going, well, okay, well, when's the rest of it going to come out? But I guess, again, maybe it's a sign of the times where it's like, maybe it's just better to put out Radio King snare drums or Dynasonics or whatever it is, you know. Well, dip your toe in a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm re- hopeful, I'm, too. Yeah. yeah, I'm really hopeful. But yeah, I'm a huge fan. And of course, like I said, we, we talked before we started doing the podcast. You know, um, there's so many things that I constantly am learning about the company. Sure, and uh, you know, and I mean, like I said, we can if if we were let's say for example, you found a, a snare drum at a garage sale. Well, you and I, we could sit here and talk. Okay, well, here's this is the strainer. Yeah, they, they did this from this year to that year. But to kind of summarize it all, you know, I try yeah. to, I you know, try to keep it a little more contained. But those were the things that, as as far as a fan of the brand, that I always noticed. You know, whether I was restoring or playing. You know, I'd get a sure. Radio King. Oh. Man, it's clamshell. I hate those things. Or, <laughs> yeah. you know, these L arms are sliding. But again, I love the sound of them. You it's know, it's a piece and of history. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it, it really is. They are history. And I hope to see that. I hope to see DW do, for example, what Ludwig did. Ludwig really reintroduced the brand, you know, a number of years, whatever, yeah. probably 15, 20 years ago, whenever it happened. And all these other drummers came back. Yeah, they're. And awesome. they came, they, yeah, they love Ludwig because they asked how they grew up on, whether yeah. it was Ringo or just whatever. Yeah, and they really redesigned hardware. So I hope the same thing for Slingerland. And I think if there's anybody that's going to do it, it would be DW. You know, I, I really do. Yeah, I agree. I really do think anything's possible. Like, you're, you know, not, I, you're not gone, you know. Right. I'm just happy. I really honestly never thought that anybody would pick it up. I just, I really thought it was dead. Yeah. I, you know, so it, there's there's hope there. But again, now we... Where you know the, the sign of the times. I mean, again, you know the crazy world we're living in. Uh, maybe it's smart that they just do snare drums, but I hope that it really grows to be something more. You know, and and I would I love too. to see some some great drummers. There's so many amazing drummers out in the world right now. I would hope that maybe one of you know they could be the new Gene Krupa. So yeah, to speak. exactly. Bring you bring know? it back and represent it. And I absolutely, mean, you think of all these brands. There's there's been. Um, I mean, not to keep talking about Ludwig, but there's so many ups and downs in that company history that is just like, they're gone. Now they're back. Now they're WFL. Now they're back. They're, it's like, it's, yeah, right. it's just, you know, you, you never count them fully out. And I think well, that. And you know what? Honestly, thank, thank goodness. Because, you know, it's nice to have, not everybody's going to be, uh, not everybody can just buy only A and F drums. You know, no. and I endorse their, their drums. I love them. Sure. But there's, there, you know, there's my, you know, you, you yourself or yep. one of my other fr- drummer friends, they might like the sound of Ludwig or Slinger. We need to have all those different companies. You do, yeah. You know, really. But um, it's, yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a tough market. Like anything, cars, you know. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm a Ford man. I'm a Chevy man. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. But, um, yeah, I hope that, I hope that they can. Keep going, you know. Yeah. And I, you know, it's like, uh, and, and it's crazy because I don't know why I was just was thinking. But we were talking about all these other companies like Trixon or Vox, where they were doing these crazy yeah. ideas. Well, exactly. maybe it's time. You know what? I mean, maybe it's time for another crazy idea and something to spur interest in 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 the Slingerland brand. But you know, yeah. I, I guess it could be in a lot of ways seen as like a conflict of interest in my case. But I love the story i love the brand you know even though i endorse another company i yeah. love it it's the mystique you know and um 
the excitement, you know, my dad had all the drum catalogs when I was growing up. I would sit so there cool. and, I, you, know, how, you, know, you know how we like look at all these catalogs and uh, they, how the drums are set up? Yeah. First of all, none of those, in, in all those catalogs, nobody could really play those kits set up no, that way. they're too spread out. The, <laughs> the head is like sense. on the wrong side. Yeah, yeah. right. I'm like, because <laughs> of course, as a, as a teenager, then I, I, I would set my drum set up. It was past nine o'clock at night. So I would just look at my drums and I would set them up, you know, I'd like the catalog. And I'm thinking, well, I can't play this. No, but um, you know it was <laughs> like so funny. Yeah, th- th- there was that whole side of it. You know, looking through. I had years ago. I bought a bunch of old Slingerland catalogs, and I just love looking at it. You know, and um, looking at the setups and what they like. Again, we, we were talking about earlier: Jobber, yep. Ensemble, uh, Windsor, or you know the Krupa yeah. Deluxe. You know, yeah. And it, it, you know, it's it, there's that whole like the child in you. Oh, that excitement, God. you know, it doesn't go away. It never. You're right. It doesn't. Yeah. And you know what? The all these companies, they know that about us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they get us, because yeah. somehow they. But um, yeah, again, coming back, bringing it back to Slingerland. Um, yeah, that was my first fascination, you know, when it came to drums. And uh, it's again, I, I hope that things I hope things are, you know, they go in a positive direction. I think they will. But I, you know, I actually I. Love the fact that you asked me to do this podcast because I love just you, you know I, I love talking about drums, but of course Slingerland. Yeah, you know, we love talking about drummers. You know, we talk exactly. about we could talk about all the different in, people that endorse Slingerland through the years. Some come and go because they're looking for free drums or they did yep. get you know whatever it is. But a buddy uh, floating around from brand oh, to brand. Oh boy, buddy, <laughs> Vox, and, you know, yeah. all, you know, and you're like, wow, he did that, huh? Yeah, yeah. But and we know those stories, but you know, like. Uh, there was a lot of people that believed in the brand. Like Gene, you know, just the story, again, not only did Gene sell a lot of drums for them, but he, I mean, there's, of course, he had a Gladstone snare and he screwed around with some Dynasonics, but he was dedicated to the brand, you know, and it yes. was, yes. that was of that era too. And I think that, I think there's still a lot of people that are dedicated and, and, and you know, to a brand or, yeah. you know, to a company. Loyal. Yeah. Loyal, yeah. Uh, but it was so many great drummers. They loved Slingerland and they believed in it. So, you hmm. know, um, it's a yeah. great story. You know, just like any other company. I'm not going to take that away from Ludwig or Rod. Oh no, they, you know, it, it's all the 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 tapestry of you know our rich history of being drummers. I mean, it's all. It, it wouldn't be as interesting if we had one brand. <laughs> you know, no, we wouldn't. Correct. Yes, yeah. we wouldn't. Well, there would be no no reference. We would only have one. Dr- you know, and that's not uh, no. fair either. I'd have and like it's... four episodes of the podcast and would be out of uh, <laughs> content. Yeah. So you've never played a Radio King. <laughs> I've never played a Radio King. No. Wow. Okay, I, I gotta get someone to send you one. I've never been in that position where I've sure. been, been there playing. I've played, you know, countless other iconic snares but uh i've never played sure a radio of course game. we all have yeah. yeah yeah and i'm sure you have more than one snare <laughs> my yes i have like nine <laughs> or ten yeah yes yeah 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 i know we i hide them in the basement as well uh <laughs> sneak them in the back door exactly this, no this is an old one <laughs> yeah no 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 i just no i just borrowed it and he was giving it back yeah, yeah. I, we all did that move but yeah. uh yeah i mean again i don't I don't take away from any of the other companies, but yeah, Slingerland always has a really special place in my heart. And yeah. um, well, you're, you're a good ambassador of the brand. Um, well, you know what? And again, I feel bad because I, again, I do endorse another company, which I love their drums. They're fantastic. But uh, yeah, there's something, it's, it's almost like a, um, yeah, it's, it's like this, uh, the kid in me. Oh yeah. This is history. Yeah. This is, we're talking his, 1930s. Yeah. A&F is awesome and is, is oh my God. a game changer. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and the fact that I can call there and I, or contact them and I can speak to the owner, just yeah. like all, like Gene Krupa could call Slingerland and talk to, to the, you know, to, to everybody there, the people that own the company and they're yeah. actually on the floor. Yeah. Um, that's lost. That got lost. But I, with A&F, I have that, which is fantastic. But yeah, um, Hey, I'm still giddy. I love this. I love that we're sitting here talking about it because I can go on and talk about the lugs and we, in which we did. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I really truly love. I'm a fan of of the instrument and certainly oh. of in that case because I if you ask me anything about Ludwig, I wouldn't know what era. I might be like, oh, is that six? I don't. Is that like sixties or seventies? Yeah, you got to know your 
you, you know, know, I just never got into it. But Slingerland, yeah, was a, I was a big drum geek. <laughs> and I, you know, well put. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I want to tell people that they can find you. So on Instagram, you're obviously on there as just John Sparrow, right? Yeah, Probably John your... Sparrow 76, yep. which somebody else snagged John Sparrow. Oh. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm not on tour. Unfortunately, most of us aren't. Sure. But I'm, I'm always willing to talk to anybody and, you know, anybody can reach out to me. Yeah, for sure. And nerd out and all that stuff. So when the world carries on so if you're listening to this in a year or whatever and everything's back to normal just remember that things were not normal for a while um but <laughs> catch john with the violent femmes um super you know famous and iconic band so um john i appreciate you coming on here and just yeah sharing no your thanks passion. for thanks for listening to me ramble about being a, a dorky kid loving <laughs> slinger <-like> drums. <laughs> we're 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 still darks man come on <laughs> absolutely it doesn't doesn't change no awesome thank you john of course. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.